Welcome everyone to Transformation Talk. I'm Tairo Hassan, the director of Brightline at PMI. Our transformation talk today will be about open strategy and resiliency. I would like to welcome Christian Stadler in the conversational transformation talk. Christian is a professor of strategic management at Warwick Business School. His award-winning book, Open Strategy, Mastering Disruption from Outside the C-Suite, helps to adjust to a new and more open world. In 2021, Thinkers 50 shortlisted Christian for the Strategy Award. Welcome, Christian. It's my pleasure, Tiro. Let us start. And uh, Christian, of course, we talk about our strategy. And uh, the first thing that came, came to me was, why strategy? What drove you toward a strategy <laughs> as a topic? Wow. Um... I don't know, I'm, I need to go back a fair bit. Yeah, right after I uh, finished high school, I did one year in the army uh, and I became an officer in the reserve army in Austria. So I guess that might have been the early days or maybe even earlier. I enjoyed the chess a lot, you know, when I was uh, was young and, and many people associate that with strategy. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 it's super cool, you know? I mean, you have to admit, you know, how, how else can you sort of, you know, engage your mind as much as thinking about the big questions what an organization can do? It's, it's just, you know, uh, it gets you up in the morning. Wonderful, wonderful. And then of course we say strategy is one way of at least uh, carving or shaping the future for organizations. And uh, we know uh, implementing or implementation of a strategy would be something that is key. Now, I mean, I know, I mean, I've met you and uh, when we were at the director forum last year in Vienna, and I've saw also the book uh, Open Strategy that you, you, you released. The first question that people ponder or ask themselves, what is open strategy? <laughs> it's, it's actually pretty straightforward, yeah? So usually strategy is made by a relatively small group of very senior people. They sit together in the boardroom and they think about what should the organization do? The proposition I make in my courses uh, make is we need to open the much larger group of people. And, you know, when I first heard that, actually, I was a bit reluctant myself. It's my courses. They met uh, a couple of years ago, actually a few more years ago in Munich, and they talked about this, this topic and said, you know, let's, let's get Christian into this. Yeah, uh, he has been involved in writing some books, etc. And when they first approached me, I thought, you know, really? I mean, you know, strategy is, as we all think, something for the top leadership but i was intrigued enough to actually you know participate in looking into the topic and uh, as i engaged in it i noticed over time wow this this stuff is powerful yeah it helps you with two of the most fundamental problems that we have in strategy the first one is where do we get fresh ideas and by reaching beyond the usual cohort of people we're more likely to get fresh ideas uh, open innovation people know that for a long time the second big problem, which I think is, is a topic very dear to your heart, is the execution side. Why, uh, you know, a variety of, uh, of surveys show that usually strategy goes wrong during execution. And by involving people, they buy in automatically. They also know what it means for them if they get engaged uh, in the strategy making process and how they need to translate that. Hence, it's for execution. So, you know, from, from an uh, original skeptic, I've, uh, I guess, turned into a prophet. Interesting, interesting. And then, of course, you know, we talk about moving from idea to reality. So the concept of open strategy, how mm -hmm. did it evolve from that idea to having more organization uh, using it in practice? Okay, yeah, so uh, so one of, uh, of the course is actually is the managing director of a small German consulting company, they called Innovative Management Partners. And uh, they have worked and helped companies for, for many years to open up their strategy. They have done over 200 projects that help organizations. Now, you know, we, as we started to work on, uh, on our book, we uh, reached out beyond that. Yeah, we searched for companies who have done this thing. We found uh, very extreme examples, you know, who would have thought that the CEO previously opened up uh, some of their strategy making uh, processes. Uh, who would expect the Navy to do this? Uh, uh, we found large companies, we found small companies uh, who do it. We found people who do it uh, using more digital tools. We found others who use more of a workshop uh, type model uh, to do it. But you know, it, it's actually 
It's fair to spread than maybe I initially thought. Around a third of all strategic initiatives are open to some extent, uh, at least that's, you know, according to a survey that we did. Uh, that's, you know, that's decent. Uh, and what's more, uh, about 50% of the revenues and profits that organizations make come from this one third of initiatives. So not only is it actually a bit more common than we thought, it also does make a real difference to the bottom line. Thank you. And now, of course, as we talk about uh, uh, strategies, sometimes people will say, if it is not broken also, don't fix it, right? So maybe mm -hmm. if we look at the traditional way that people implement strategy or develop strategy, what were the shortcomings that you were seeing there for traditional, what I would call traditional, quote unquote, yeah. uh, strategy development? Yeah, so, you know, first thing, we invest a lot in strategy. I think uh, just on consultants, uh, companies spend about 30 billion uh, a year. Nonetheless, a lot of this stuff goes wrong. It depends on which survey you look at, yeah, but somewhere between 50 and 90% uh, of strategies don't deliver to the extent that we would hope them uh, to, to deliver. Now, you know, there's, there's not the right balance between the sort of money we put into this and what we get out. Um, I stressed in the beginning already uh, that I think the, the kind of core problem is this disconnect between those people who come up with an idea and those who have to introduce these uh, ideas where design and, and execution is separated. And if that's the case, you know, uh, I notice I'm preaching to the choir here when, when I talk to you, yeah? yeah. But, but <laughs> when, when, you have, when you have that uh, disconnect, it's not surprising, you know? Um, one of the sort of favorite uh, things uh, I came across uh, was an initiative in Barclays uh, where Ashok Vaswani uh, became the leader of the retail business for Barclays in 2012 it was. And, uh, you know, I had a conversation with him where he said, you know, Christian, strategy in the end is, is fairly sim simple. I want to know where I'm at the moment. I want to know where I want to go and I want to know how I can go there. And people at every level of the organization have answers to that. Now, why not involve them? You know, it, it's, it seems to be so obvious. He did that in a massive, massive initiative where uh, they set up uh, a strategy jam. Think of it a little bit like an online conference type setting involving all 30,000 people uh, in Barclays. And uh, re results were phenomenal uh, for them. They, uh, uh, they, they kind of saw this real link yeah, that we, uh, we're hoping uh, to get between the big ideas where sure, you know, digital is going to come, but what does it mean for me? Somebody threw up this question in the mortgage uh, group, uh, Domino's Pizza can tell you when you order pizza, when the pizza gets some ingredients on, when you put the pizza in the oven, when the pizza comes out of the oven, when the pizza is on the way to you, we, in the mortgage department, we can only tell you, we got your mortgage application. And in the end, we either, you know, thumbs up, you get a mortgage under whatever conditions or thumbs down, you don't get a mortgage, but nothing in between. Just no longer in sync, yeah? And actually digitalization offers methods to do that. Um, when you look at the results of this uh, initiative, yeah, where uh, I talked to a, a variety of executives there, they were saying the vibrance you got around the strategy topic uh, inside Barclays Retail, it was unmatched. You know, they've never had that uh, before. And, uh, you know, just the other day, I was actually sharing this example in my executive MBA class and somebody put up their hand and said, yeah, I worked for Barclays at, uh, at that time. And it was amazing uh, what happened. They introduced um, uh, the first mobile app shortly after the jam. You know, almost overnight got a million users. Today, nine million users makes it one of the most successful fintech uh, apps in the in the United Kingdom. Uh, return on equity went up in a really pretty tough market environment. So it pays off, and uh, you know, it seems so logic. Why not engage the brain of everyone in your organization? Interesting. Now, this, this is great. And I know, you know, uh, in 2017, we did release what we call Brightline Guiding Principle. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that you were saying, the first principle, strategy design, uh, strategy delivery is as important as uh, strategy design. So it's mm -hmm. not just the thinking, but actually making sure that that thinking, that idea becomes reality. Let's hear from uh, attendees here. Let, let's have a first poll because you, you explain what is an uh, open strategy. Let's see how organization uh, might be re re receiving or receptive to open strategy concept. So we're looking forward to hear from you. How receptive do you feel your organization would be to the idea of open strategy? Wonderful. So this is, this is uh, what we get here. So about uh, 
I would say 83% uh, say uh, uh, that the organism will either be receptive or somewhat receptive. And then we have 70. So now we have to admit, you know, as, as a professor, uh, I see that we, of course, have a biased sample here. We prompted them beforehand. <laughs> uh, I, I was I was advertising the concept so much that everyone kind of almost was afraid, I think, to say no. No, no, I mean, people are straight here, uh, as we say, straight talk. And of course, I was looking at the at the onset here. We said uh, where, where we were talking about uh, the data. And the data, I mean, from one of the surveys that you had, was saying after 200 corporate, uh, corporate uh, uh, leaders were surveyed, uh, mm -hmm. they were saying like, uh, although 30% of the effort use open strategy methodology, mm -hmm. those same initiatives nevertheless produce 50% of their revenues and profits. Mm -hmm. Can you share mm -hmm. us uh, more on that one? Can you share more? Yeah, maybe uh, I, we also had, there was a separate survey that we did where we looked, uh, walked, looked a bit more into the benefits as well uh, of uh, open strategy. And we've touched upon this earlier. I already mentioned that I think it's primarily sort of, you know, execution and new ideas. Um, the survey gave us some confidence in that direction as well. We had um, uh, of those surveyed, 70% said that opening up uh, increased both uh, increased the commitment uh, uh, to the strategic initiative uh, and it's not surprising you know if people have a voice uh, then they feel uh, more likely that they should be supportive and 69 percent of those surveyed said that they get uh, more and even more importantly more diverse ideas by opening up uh, the strategy so you know points in the same direction and i'd say you know um if anything people are even more embracive and sort of positive about uh, the, the power of openness. Some of it might have to do with uh, digital tech, uh, technologies enabled to do that. And many of us became just much more comfortable in the digital world during the pandemic where we had no choice other than uh, use all this stuff. So that, that might help. Um, I wonder maybe at the moment there's, there's a lot of sort of unprecedented challenges where uh, I think many leaders wonder, wow, what do I do? You know, I have inflation that uh, is changing things uh, substantially. I have a massive disruption in the supply chain that I need to deal with. I have uh, problems to find enough people uh, to work uh, for me. And then there's the still the sort of, you know, big topics that previously organizations were already starting to think about like climate change. Uh, so, you know, with all of those things, not really, really having many examples of how to deal with them, it's maybe natural that we are looking for uh, more advice and maybe from advice from corners where we didn't look before. Yeah, great. And of course, if you saw the sample survey that we just ran, about 61% or so were saying the organization will be somewhat open and 17% were saying the organization will not be open. I'm not saying this is a scientific poll, but uh, to the people who were, it could be somewhat receptive or not receptive at all, how can the organization prepare themselves to take an endeavor such as open strategy? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm looking a, a more like uh, points, how. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, a couple of points uh, about this. Uh, the first one is if the leadership is not into it, don't waste your time. You know, it's really, it's not going to work without uh, uh, the leadership because in the end, uh, open strategy is not a suggestion to turn a company into a democracy. Uh, it is a way for leaders to engage uh, a wider group of people, but they still call the final shot. So if they don't really buy into it, it's not going to work. Um, I know one example from a German engineering company where um, the, the leadership was sort of somewhere, well, you know, we can give it a shot, but really, I don't know, it's a cool tool, so let's let's, let's try it, yeah? And then um, uh, when you look sort of one layer down, there was more or less a split between those who thought uh, that the ideas that came out from uh, a process of that kind were, were good and the other half were not. It was basically a, a push uh, into more servitization and a lot of the core guys were engineers who didn't quite you know, feel comfortable with that. And because there was never full buy into this, this didn't go anywhere. So in other words, you know, don't start trying to do this if the leadership is not into it. And we can talk a little bit later afterwards how you might get people on, uh, on board if not. That's the first thing. The second thing is don't take your, you know, your, your core strategy and straight away uh, open up everything around this core strategy. My suggestion would be uh, to take maybe one of the 
projects, initiatives, or a smaller business where you see some uh, uh, some promise, which maybe you uh, can expect some disruption uh, and see how it works. Uh, Dr. Oetker, that I get it out, a German company uh, that is big in uh, food production. Uh, they've tried it out first in the cereal pit, uh, business, which is one of their smaller businesses. They really liked how it worked. They got familiar also uh, how to do that. And then in the next step, they uh, opened up the, the pizza business, which is their biggest business, uh, frozen pizza. Uh, so, you know, experiment a little bit. You see. That, that would be my core points here. Yeah, uh, Only do if you're really uh, into it and uh, experiment in an area where you don't kind of straight on go into the big, big territory. Wonderful. So I'm hearing leadership first. Uh, so uh, getting them to, uh, to, to, to own it and to lead it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, don't take the core strategy out uh, right away. Take a small piece and then yeah. uh, uh, or maybe open that one and then see how you progress. I have a question here coming from Richard Dillard. And I want to remind attendees that you can continue to ask questions or engage in the chat here. And Richard is asking, how does open strategy differ from open book management or the great game, the great game of business by Jack Stack or mm -hmm. Hoshin uh, Kenrin, I hope I'm spelling it right, where you, uh, where you play catch ball between senior leaders. Senior leaders are setting the strategy and every, everyone else get the strategy in terms of uh, the negotiations of the means and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. he, he gave two or three other reference how, what, what difference do you see uh, with open strategy? So I'm not, I'm not that you are aware of mentions, yeah? but, uh, but in general terms, uh, open strategy for me is almost a philosophy yeah? that you do strategy making in a different way. And then there's many, many different techniques. And it's possible that the ones that he mentions would be some of those techniques that help the organization to open up. Uh, you know, uh, I have some of uh, those tools and techniques that uh, uh, I've come across and, sh and then shared with, uh, with people, but that by no means that this is an exhaustive list. Yeah. And in, in fact, you know, uh, this is, this reminds me, um, uh, uh, Julia is one of the people I worked with uh, here, and I had uh, previously talked about creating a web page where we sort of, you know, collect all the different tools and give people uh, an opportunity to share as well. So I think I, I you know, I picked that idea up again uh, because there's, there's certainly more out there than I would have been able to collect uh, during the work that we've done. Excellent. And then, you know, um, when we talk about it also, people are looking for examples. And I remember starting reading the book. I think it was the opening by uh, Gary Hamel or so, or where yeah. there is a reference to Nokia uh, in yeah. the days, what Nokia did and opened the strategy and so on. And that was what propelled Nokia to where they were. And then later on, maybe they didn't follow that. Could you share maybe two examples of companies and you can take different sure. industries? Two examples yeah, yeah, of sure. companies that have used it and what did they do that helped them? Okay, okay. Um, let me start with a, uh, a slightly unusual st uh, story. Um, so a few years back, uh, there was a little online competition available uh, for people which invited them to contribute ideas that helps to capture the migration of, uh, of bison. So, you know, uh, the idea seemed to be here that uh, people go into national parks, uh, uh, you know, throughout the year and they talk, take tons of pictures, they post them online and these pictures that are posted, they have some sort of geodata there as well. If there's an algorithm that somebody develops that helps us to track uh, that we could better, uh, you know, track the migration uh, of bisons and then could potentially, you know, uh, think about how um, uh, how to do, do a work on conservation. Now, um, we talked to the organizer of this particular initiative and uh, he shared with us that uh, it was a major success. They got a algorithm uh, that was uh, super efficient in uh, a much shorter time than usually these things are uh, uh, developed and much cheaper. It was, however, for a very different purpose than the one that, uh, that were advertised. It was one set up by the intelligence community in the United States in order to find an algorithm that helps them from various online sources to track Russian uh, troop movements in Crimea in, back in 2014. So, you know, uh, this, this 
example shows us also how we can reach out to communities without sharing too much information uh, and then uh, you know still getting solutions to very kind of tricky uh, issues uh, that uh, otherwise we might have not found we certainly would have spent more money on but in this particular case it was important to dress it up as a different type of uh, of uh, request because otherwise you can easily imagine that there would be a operators uh, from the Russian side who would maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide algorithms that look like they work, but they don't quite work, or if they know exactly how an algorithm works, that they could adjust uh, their strategic moves uh, 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 accordingly. Yeah? So it's, it's sort of, you know, an unusual uh, example that shows us that we can even open up in very sort of, you know, tricky situations. Um, Another nice uh, example is maybe I can share that and give you a sense of one of the tools that I like a lot uh, uh, with that second example. So the second example is from a, um, uh, a company called Gallus in, uh, in Germany. And that's a company that uh, produces uh, printing uh, equipment, so printing machines. And uh, they conducted uh, a, uh, a nightmare competitor exercise. The way this works is that you bring people together in a three-day workshop, uh, roughly sort of 50 to 60 people tends to be good in a good number. Minimum, I would say sort of 35-ish. Half of the people who participate in these workshops are inside the organization, and half of the people who participate in these workshops are from outside the organization. You then create mixed teams, and these mixed teams develop a, uh, a business idea about a non-existent sort of imaginary company, which would be presenting a massive nightmare for you. you know, they they kind of would kill your business if they would uh, actually exist. You then, uh, you know, have people present the initial idea. You have a round of voting where you uh, vote out the, uh, the less popular ideas. You form uh, new teams where the losers join the winners, and then they work on developing a more detailed business model using this, uh, this approach. Uh, in this case, you know, they came up with a nightmare competitor uh, idea around um, a, a printing uh, business uh, model that was much more platform based than they've ever thought of uh, before. I mean, they haven't done that at all uh, themselves and in, initiate uh, in them, uh, you know, a, a start in working actually into, into this direction. Uh, and this was supposed to go live uh, actually uh, during the pandemic, but then the pandemic sort of slowed it down. And I think uh, this is something that is coming up uh, uh, shortly that they, they go live with this uh, idea. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you drive out ideas that you wouldn't usually have bringing outsiders into this uh, conversation in a, you know, setup that is very gaming find wonderful and thank you let, let, let us bring back the, uh, the, the attendees again because of course uh, when we talk about open strategy we also say that we need to get the entire organization involved and we need to involve uh, in, internal external and there are questions regarding it uh, what we should do so let's have Rohit bring us the second uh, uh, poll question uh, just to hear what people think because uh, in terms of the uh, openness is it internal is it external the, the vast majority actually are saying both. So getting the external and uh, the external and internal involvement and only limited people were saying um, just the external here. Any reaction to these numbers? Uh, oh, here we have it. Oh, interesting. Uh, so only external is, uh, is small, uh, fair number of uh, internals, a lot of them both. So I would say it depends on the, um, on the particular issue or problem that you want to tackle. What makes sense? Um, one way I like to think about it is also uh, in um, in sort of boxes. Yeah, boxes in the sense there is one strategy box that deals with the development of ideas. There's one box that deals with uh, formulating and fine tuning a strategy, and then there's one box that deals uh, more with the introduc uh, introduction of these ideas to a wider uh, audience, sort of the execution side. And um, depending on which one of these boxes are, you might have slightly different compositions. Now, if you look about the new idea generation, you would probably want to have a sizable outside uh, community involved uh, in this. The experience from, uh, from IMP has been that um, in workshop type settings, uh, like the one that I described with the nightmare competitor, you have to have a minimum of 50% of external participants. The reason is, the externals are drowned out very easily in these conversations. 
we all know this, yeah? Okay, great idea, but it doesn't work here. It's different for us. So you need outside <laughs> voices and you need enough of them and you need strong voices to, uh, to overcome that. So that's for the idea generation, yeah? Um, for the formulation part uh, of a strategy, you might have um, a slightly smaller group of, of internal uh, externals involved uh, because that's when you need to fine tune things in a way that it really works with all the processes, uh, uh, the culture, etc. in mind of how things are done in the organization. So if you don't have enough adjustments uh, to, uh, to your organization, uh, then that, that won't work. Yeah. Uh, and in the final uh, stage, yeah, um, uh, when you open up primarily to get traction for your ideas, then you only need those externals who would need to be on board in order to make things happen. So, you know, if you have a business that depends on a wider ecosystem, uh, if you have business partners, then you would involve those business uh, uh, partners. Um, IBM did one of those uh, very, very big exercises uh, a long time ago, actually, which involved 160,000 people. And that also involved, I think it was 60 partner organizations. The reason was they initiated the whole process primarily because they realized there's a lot of cool ideas in IBM, but often they're duplications. They're all over the world. Uh, and uh, for IBM to make a difference with something, you need to create bigger business units who work on the same thing. And you often need to create units that involve partnerships with outsiders as well. So, you know, for, for that, uh, that's clearly sort of, you know, focused on uh, bringing together things that exist already rather than coming up with something entirely new. It was important that you have those partners involved but you wouldn't need externals uh, involved in this process who have nothing to do with the business. Thank you. And then, you know, you know uh, when uh, two years ago, three years ago, actually, we released what we call the Brightland Transformation Compass. And one of the block in the Brightland Transformation Compass was about getting insight from customers and uh, also the mega trends. So meaning that uh, uh, it's not insulated. You're looking at what the customers are, are looking for you looking at also the mega trend and so on and i want to dive deep uh, into the part regarding the competitions because when you're looking at mega trends sometimes you're looking at uh, um, including the competition and you mentioned that in the book uh, regarding the importance of including competitors in your strategic deliberation can you expand a little bit more on that like uh, yeah, i know sure. you were saying maybe take a competitor and so how do you have how do you try to have the eyes or the perspective of your competitors uh, as you're doing that, that deliberation. Yeah, so, you know, I don't want to over push that point either. Yeah, obviously, you know, uh, there's uh, some barriers we need to build with competitors and we can't just open our books and say, you know, let's work on, uh, on this together. But we, we are in a very complex world where, first of all, some companies which we compete with in some areas actually cooperate with us in other areas. So in those areas where we cooperate, it makes sense, you know, that we open to that extent that it's necessary uh, to, uh, to involve them. Um, the second thing with, uh, you know, opening up uh, to your, your competitor could be if we do it in a style like the we have seen it earlier from uh, my example from the intelligence communities, where others can be involved without knowing what exactly will happen uh, uh, with that information. That was a bit extreme, but uh, the Navy actually has, you know, been more deliberate about uh, it, opening up to uh, quite wide community asking them about what they think would be big uh, big trends that affect the, the navy and uh, i'm sure that you know some smart operators from uh, other countries would have had the option to uh, contribute to this as well the navy even shared afterwards were the main what the main trends were that they found but what they did not share is what they did with this information yeah so you know uh, you open up but you you don't necessarily tell them what exactly you do the third consideration is uh, here that, you know, if you invite some of your competitors to participate in one of those uh, processes, you uh, through, through that process itself, you're already ahead of your competitors and you start implementing your ideas uh, at the time when they start to know what you do. Now, they would probably very soon after realize that anyway, because you go to the market with something, but you will be in the market before somebody else is. And, you know, speed has become uh, a very crucial component of, of success uh, in many market spaces. So having that advantage of being uh, first 
is one that uh, your competitors uh, cannot really make up anyway. So, you know, uh, there is room to maneuver to involve some, uh, some competitors without going, you know, going crazy and just, you know, saying, you know, let's join all uh, in a board meeting and you can hear what exactly we're up to. Uh, you know, I, I would not go that far. Excellent. And uh, we, we, we have a question from Juan Miguel Robles. And uh, I mean, he has actually two questions. The first one goes back to the funda foundation. So maybe you'll help us uh, in an MBA 101. Today, there's a lot of confusion regarding what, means, what strategy means. Yeah. Uh, so he's asking uh, really, what is your definition of strategy? And then linking to, uh, in your experience, how an open strategy is implemented when teams was open. So you have a team that is open, but the area of the departments aren't open. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to say something which is it will at first sound even a bit contradictory. In in essence, strategy is about making choices of what what you can do and uh, what you should be doing. There's an excellent new book by uh, Dick Romel, which is called The Crux. And uh, he has these two parameters uh, that he looks at. How important is a particular issue that you face as an organization? And uh, how addressable is this uh, particular issue? So, you know, you should focus on those which are very important, but also addressable. If we just think about, wow, fantastic opportunity, but we actually do not have the resources uh, to address them, we are in La La Land. Yeah. So, you know, forget about this. Likewise, if we have all the right resources, but we go after something that, that really doesn't matter, then you know, waste waste your resources on the wrong initiatives. So you know, try on the on the top line to find those uh, uh, those cracks uh, or these cracks. Yeah, this sort of uh, fixing. Now, and where I contradict myself slightly, I also think that strategy in the end is made up of hundreds, sometimes thousands, small decisions in an organization. Yeah. So yes, there's this one big headline, but really it materializes through many small initiatives. And uh, you know, they, they're not all gonna be lovely and perfectly aligned, but they should work in some sort of similar trajectory. And that's sort of, again, where you know, we come back to my, my earlier point, when you open up, people understand what that big trajectory is likely to be, and they're more likely to work uh, in that, uh, that same direction. We do want a bit of dissonance yeah, in an organization. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it shouldn't go as far as being chaotic. Great. And when you were saying made a decision, I was thinking again of, of a guiding principle because one of the guiding principles about the six is like about be bold and then uh, move quick and so on. Because sometimes in terms of decisions, people are afraid to decide. People feel like, uh, okay, we can postpone, they can wait. Yeah. And uh, I mean, often we say, if you don't decide, actually you decided. You made the decision not to decide. And when you make that, then you cannot move. So great to see that actually it's not just one. There are many decisions and then all of them actually help move toward the implementation and uh, the direction that the organization wants to go in. Let me bring another one here. And this question is about the front line. Because you were saying, in any case, it used to be maybe the realm or the remit of executives. And we're saying at the end, you need the whole organization for the implementation. So what I want to hear from you here, and this is more tactical, uh, what are some of the tactics that you can use to engage frontline employees in the overall strategy development process uh, and, and how does that work? Okay, so one, one way is that you do it targeted, yeah? That you don't involve everyone, but you deliberately pick out some people from the front line and bring them in, uh, into this conversation. I shared earlier the Barclays example, but I only talked about the second stage where they had the, you know, the big platform engagement. There was an earlier stage uh, where they had work groups. And some of those work groups were people who recently joined Barclays. The, uh, the idea was that those who recently joined, their thinking was not tainted by the way things are done in Barclays. Yeah? They had a fresh mind uh, on things. So really kind of, you know, from uh, they, they're in, in pretty junior roles, they, they just came out of, uh, of uni and you bring them in, it's a sort of selected group uh, of frontline employees uh, who are helpful. So that's one way. And the other one is, uh, 
Primary then, yes, with digital tools, we involve very large groups of uh, people. Telefonica does that really well. They have this um, online platform that uh, it grew over time. Yeah, where it sort of just first started in preparation for their annual leadership gathering. They allowed some people to engage in a discussion forum. Then, you know, this worked really well. Then they made it possible during the leadership for, uh, forum for people to come in as well. And, and it's now a permanent feature where there's thousands of people discussing all sorts of things. They're not Everything will be, you know, just just you know, strictly about the big strategic ideas. But uh, it does engage people around those topics. Now it works for two reasons. Yeah, number one, you need to have somebody who moderates and looks after this. Yeah, so if people start to talk just about lunch or football on this platform, then you know they need a reminder that maybe that's not the right forum uh, uh, to do that. Even though very important topics, you know, uh, but but maybe not for that forum. The second thing is um, uh, the leadership regularly engages on this platform as well. Yeah, so it gives that extra spark where you can think, particularly in these large organizations, people don't often have the opportunity to directly engage with the CEO. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool thing, you know, you want to say something, if then the CEO picks it up and responds to this, you know, it makes you there, you go home, you know, uh, and you tell your wife uh, or your husband, and they'll say, you know, well done, you know, the big shots are listening to you. Uh, so, you know, that is an important ingredient also to make this work. Excellent. No, this, is, this is really, really awesome here. Uh, let, let us move to one place because we were talking. Now, here I, I, I mentioned, by the way, you know, I'm quite happy. We're keeping the numbers fairly stable. We're not boring them too much. Uh, no, uh, they're not yeah. dropping off in big, <laughs> in big numbers. So that's that's a very good one. So so, so you you just say that you want them to stay until the end, which is good. Uh, Absolutely. So, yes. uh, uh, let, uh, let, let, let's go to the, the next one because we talk about resiliency. Okay, because uh, when we we mention open strategy and resiliency. I want you to help us connect the two. How does open uh, strategy helps in ensuring organizational resilience? Well, you know, think of what, why are we often not resilient? We're not resilient because, well, we do it because we're told to, but in the end, do we fully buy it? Mm, I don't know, yeah? Do we fully understand what it's like? I don't know, yeah? But, uh, you know, even if difficulties come, if pressures mount and we are fully on board, we we will stand up, yeah? And we also know sometimes who else we can ask and bring into uh, uh, this, uh, this conversation. Uh, let me give you a nice uh, nice example as well that sort of highlights uh, a different difficult context uh, uh, to introduce something where I think uh, the whole process that was introduced and opened up made, made it possible to achieve the success that was achieved. So this is actually about deforestation uh, in Borneo. And uh, you know, when, when you kind of go after such a topic as a Western NGO, often it would be experts who have an idea, they introduce it to the local community and then hope it, uh, it works, yeah? But, uh, you know, that, surprise, surprise, doesn't work quite as well as it should often. So there was an American lady, uh, Tiani West, uh, Webb, who decided to do this in a very different way. And she started um, her whole um, initiative attempt to save the rainforest by engaging the locals. She did something that she referred to as radical listening, where uh, she and the others in, in her NGO talked to 400 people in one particular area uh, where there was a lot of illegal uh, logging. And they asked them, uh, so you are the guardians of this rainforest. What do you need from the world community in order to make it possible to stay as this guardian uh, of, the, uh, of the rainforest? And it turned out people cut down trees because they couldn't afford medical uh, care. Uh, you know, if you had a, a big medical incident in your family, the only option uh, for you was cut down trees. Uh, because there's no other way to get big amounts uh, of money in the, in the short term. So they set up then, this NGO, um, a, a, a medical practice uh, where people from communities where there was no illegal logging taking place got a 70% discount uh, on, uh, on treatments. On top of that, they were able to pay in kind. So, you know, they had an organic farming project they started as well uh, there, and people could come and bring manure and, you know, pay that way for, for their medical uh, treatment. Uh, the, the illegal logging in that area went down by 68%. Uh, so, you know, a, a dramatic success, which was possible because a solution was developed that was resilient 
to uh, uh, you know the sort of pressures that would really you know even though if in principle you don't want to cut down uh, the forest you will be forced to because your family needs to survive yeah here you have a solution uh, that can help you with that thank you thank you uh, christian and then we have another question from uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Ngu. And uh, his question was, can you talk about the difference between resilience and risk management? Ooh, I don't know. I, I might have to press you there. You're more of an expert on this than, than myself, uh, the hero. I, I guess <laughs> risk management, I would see it as more technical uh, and often more associated with uh, what is done in the sort of fin uh, financial industries where, where you, you look at sort of, you know, risk, risk management practices uh, as far as uh, any sort of outlying financial events are concerned. Whereas resilience, I see as a more organizational concept uh, uh, we prepared for all sorts of unusual uh, crisis uh, to be persistent when these things change. How does that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go along that one. And so sometimes resilience is also the result of risk management because as you're managing risk and looking at what is happening in the ecosystem and you're handling what could be, what could not, and you're taking the action to be stronger, then you are actually building a resilient organization. Mm -hmm. And I often say, actually, when we think about resiliency, um, Christian, I say it's not, it has to be deliberate. So it just doesn't happen. There need to be the first part where it is more about strategizing. So we're talking about open strategy, but all form of strategy, but it needs to be intentional. The second one, I say, of course, there is sometimes need to reimagine the organization. And that's sometimes part of risk management, but where you see what is happening, you see what, what the world is telling you outside. And you don't just rest and say, let me accept what is coming, otherwise you're dead maybe. But if mm -hmm. you actually want to actually survive and you want to thrive and you want to maybe achieve a business objectives, you may mm -hmm. have to transform yourself. And yeah. as part of all this, you mentioned it, people, people, people. So what type of culture you need to have that resiliency? What type of leadership you need? What type of I mean, people with this organization that you need to make sure that uh, it happened? And last but not least, in the face of crisis as well. How do you handle crisis? How do you make sure that the, the next crisis or the current crisis does not take you out? And in that perspective, actually, I want to bring you maybe one of our last questions here is how has uh, the crisis, and it's, it's, it's been a challenge for many organizations, the yeah. one that we are just coming out of, of course, it looks like we are going to another one, but how did the COVID crisis affect uh, the notion of open uh, strategy in organizations? Um, I think I mentioned before that uh, from a technical perspective, it made it easier for many companies to do it uh, because we are more familiar uh, with, with this tool. Um, it did remind everyone that it's possible that things can change quite dramatically and we need answers, uh, you know, sometimes to things that we've never thought about uh, before, where we haven't prepared ourselves uh, uh, at all. And uh, you know, when, when we are in those situations, we'll reach out to wider crowds uh, and that's where openness uh, helps us. Uh, uh, I've certainly, you know, seen um, as I, you know, I'm, I'm close still the, to the guys from this consulting firm in Germany that their business has picked up substantially. So, you know, com companies, as they wonder about these things, seem to hire people who are experts uh, in uh, using uh, those tools. Uh, so, so the market seems to recognize, you know, that there is a need for uh, for these kind of things. Wonderful. I think I think I mean we had a great conversation here. So I want to to thank you uh, a lot for spending this time with us and uh, sharing the insight when it comes to. Uh, open strategy and the connection with resiliency and so on. So we really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm looking at the chat here. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I mean, feel free to ask. I know uh, I saw a comment here. One uh, was it? Uh, uh, who was that? Uh, it was Guillaume uh, Guillaume Van der Schuren, who said that I'm sold. I just placed an order for the book on Amazon. So. It looks like a, a mission accomplished on that. I made at least one sale, huh? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> For people here, connect on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you know, just type Christian Stadler on LinkedIn. It's always nice uh, to, uh, to make new connections uh, with people. I generally write a lot uh, on whatever ideas I have uh, uh, coming up. Uh, and, you know, this way you can stay connected. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. And then, of course, thank you so much to all for joining us. I mean, uh, uh, we, we were just under the hour here. 
and we look forward to having you with us in our next transformation talks. There'll be a few series coming uh, till the end of the year. And then I want to mention also that in case you miss it, uh, if my colleague Andrea can go to the next slide, but in case you miss it, we would like to, to, to recommend um, that you take a look at uh, our uh, the CTO research. We released a CTO research uh, uh, last month. Uh, there is a slide coming up, I suspect. Uh, and uh, you may want to take a look because we were looking at uh, what CTOs do, uh, uh, what they should do, and uh, how it's helping organizations, having CTOs could help organizations in their transformation endeavors. This was a research that we've done with uh, Accenture. Uh, so uh, we highly recommend that you take a look at the research and uh, you see what it means for you. Because again, the world is in flux. The world is in flux. Things are changing. I mean, yesterday, or actually, we are even getting out of COVID and then. There is now people talking about recessions and then there's the war also that is happening. So there are many, many moving pieces. So how do we uh, bulletproof our organization? How do we get ready for the next thing, uh, which is something quite, quite important. So thank you. Uh, we, we are really happy to have you here and uh, we look forward to have you in the upcoming transformation talks. Thank you so much, uh, Christian. Yeah, my, my pleasure, my pleasure.